What's up, everybody? Welcome to this week's episode of Hidden Forces with me, Dimitri Kofinas. Today, I speak with Jeremy Hymans and Henry Timms, the authors of New Power, How Power Works in Our Hyperconnected World and How to Make It Work for You. Jeremy is the co-founder and CEO of Purpose, an organization specializing in building social movements around the world. He has been named one of Fast Company's most creative people in business and chaired the World Economic Forum's Global Council on Civic Participation, among other notable accomplishments. The book's second author, Henry Timms, is president and CEO of 92nd Street Y, a cultural and community center that creates programs and movements that foster learning and engagement. He is also the co-founder of Hashtag Giving Tuesday, a global philanthropic movement that engages people in close to 100 countries and has generated hundreds of millions of dollars for good causes. Guys, welcome to Hidden Forces. It's great to be here. It's a pleasure. <laughs> Make sure your glasses are on. <laughs> well, you know, I don't need them for audio. <laughs> How are you guys doing? Well, it's been a busy time. The book's just come out. And so it's been a, you know, a lot of hours and a lot of hustle, but it's nice to have the book out in the world. When did it officially come out? April 3, last Tuesday. So April this 3. is day 10. Day 10. Day so you 10. guys have done how many interviews so far? Uh, uh, you're kind yeah, of like... Uh, we've lost count. It's been a lot. It's so like this colli- is collisions. We, but t- Tim O'Reilly speaks highly of you and promises this will be our best interview. I appreciate that very much. And uh, Henry told me the same thing. I'm very happy to hear that. That makes me very, very happy because uh, Tim is obviously a great guy and it was a great interview. And I was telling Henry, he's you, there's a spectrum of authenticity, obviously. And right. I, I could select guests to be authentic anyway, but he definitely is on the far mm. you know fringe of authenticity. Well, we really admire... I mean, obviously, he's someone who, like everyone in our our world admires his work but he's also just someone who you know he just did i think he's one of those people who just likes to try and be helpful with people he's real he's a real connector which yeah, is kind is. of in, in line with what he thinks about right yeah well it makes sense because he that's what he did with open source right, right? i mean he convenes right. these groups yeah, together right. he's a very good human yeah it's <laughs> as opposed to a non-human that's well, right. we, 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 there we, are there are possibly you know there are theories about lizard and sort of reptilian people i know i have a friend in investment <laughs> banking who's very convinced of that literally or does he think of it metaphorically because no no he, he literally thinks it wow. um, and, and he may be in a position to know so it's his kind of thing. And the interview we did last week, the best interview we did last week was with on Canadian television. It was like a daytime. It was the show like The View. And there was like a segment on how to tell if your boyfriend really loves you. And then there was a segment on how to cook lobster. And then we did a segment on how power is shifting and what it means for you. And I did think to myself, that really is that's a good sign that we're trying to get a book which is, is really speaking to people all around to the world. Everyone, right? yeah, right. To everyone. And then there was the Oprah moment where they gave a free copy of the book to everyone in the studio audience instead of a car, I might know. They seemed to be disappointed. The audience erupted. I think they in, did, in they somewhat did. false enthusiasm. It was kind of half, it a, half eruption. The applause button. The applause yeah, thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. The red raging. lights. Well, it's not surprising to me that Tim suggested to me that I speak with the two of you because, you know, Tim's book, he talks about forces. He talks about them as vectors, really. But he also talks about models and, and modeling theory. And you guys talk about forces explicitly, not just in your book, but I've seen also in online materials that sort of promote the book. And you also have these sort of models. You have this four quadrant model, for example, where you have the different sort of people where they fall, castles. What are the other three? Castles? Cheerleaders. <laughs> I'm putting well, you on the spot. Cheerleaders. <laughs> you and, should know this. And crowds. And crowds. Yeah. But we're going to get into all of that. I mean, point being, what I find interesting and what I think where I'm coming at this conversation from is that I agree. I think all of us are experiencing these shifting dynamics of power, right? And power is something that I think interesting. That, and you guys quote Bertrand Russell, and we've talked about Bertrand on this show specifically on, on our episode on philosophical mathematics, but we didn't talk about all his political writings, of which he had many. He was a, a famous pacifist, and he lived, I think, to 100 years old. He died during the Vietnam War, and he wrote a book called Power, and he talked about this in this book, and he talked about these sort of... Well, actually, I have the quote by Bertrand right here that I really like. Let me uh, let me read it here. Power, like energy, must be regarded as continually passing from any one of its forms into any other, and it should be the business of social science to seek the laws of such transformations. Mm. And so I think, without question, we are in the midst of this transformation. We all feel it. When exactly it began, if that's even possible to sort of pick out a moment i don't know but what's interesting is you guys are trying to develop a framework and a model for understanding what these changes are in power and sort of where they're shifting and how they're shifting and and i was saying to you henry before jeremy got in that the very first subtitle i have for question one is hashtag you too because the two of you the way in which you have 
Tim O'Reilly is a great example. The way in which you've enlisted a network of people to help you promote the book and to help you get it out there. I mean, that's how I learned about it, right? And so it's a testament to what the book is really about. So tell me how the two of you came together, like how you two met, and what sort of how this book came together. So we knew each other a bit by reputation, I think. Jeremy, of course, has spent his career in online activism and been a real pioneer in that work. So co-founding movements like Avaz and Get Up in Australia and, and All Out. So I'd known about all of that kind of work, but in a very kind of activist model. And I was working at the 92nd Street Wire, which is 140 four-year-old cultural community center. But we were really thinking about how do you build civic strength in a new age, right? How do you think about that? So we've been working on projects like Giving Tuesday after Black Friday and Cyber Monday to kind of push back against that consumerism. Mm. So we kind of both knew each other's work. We met at a supper and then actually with very little thought started writing together. And then actually with a bit more thought, but not too much thought, wrote a book together. So it was just, it was kind of a, an organic and quite happy coincidence. A lot, how long ago did you meet? Maybe four, three and a half, four years ago. Mm. And then we, we worked together in, you know, it's, it's always been a labor of love, right? Because we've both got pretty demanding day jobs on the weekends and the evenings to write the HBR article that sort of launched the idea. I, I read that world. as well. Yeah. That's very good. I suggest that to anyone. Is there an easy way for people to search for that? Just that they put New yeah. Power, they can yeah, find it. Yeah, you can it. just search for our names and New Power and HBR. But yeah, that piece really took off in ways we didn't expect. It 2014 or 2015? When did uh, you? Late 2014. 2014. And, uh, you know, what we didn't expect was, you know, health workers, churches, business leaders, and political activists kind of grabbed on to that article and the frames and started running with them and using them to make their own worlds better, that we didn't expect. And so we didn't really intend to write a book, especially given that we both run organizations. But after we saw that incredible reaction, we realized that there was there was a real need to better articulate what these kind of critical new 21st century skills are. And ultimately the book, you know, goes from theory, as you know, to laying out what everyone, whether you're a dentist or an activist, whether you're running a big organization or you're just trying to get something started, what everybody needs to know about this new world and what the skills are to navigate it. And you have a lot of examples also. That's, there are a lot of case studies in the book as well. It's primarily technologically driven. I mean, this is the, it's a cultural, it's an expression of a culture, but it is a culture that is heavily defined by the technological tools that are enabling the type of sort of spontaneous creation of uh, movements and sort of crowdsourcing, et cetera. Have you found that it's people who are not natively familiar with those technologies or that have that culture embedded in them who have found your book most useful? Or has it been more useful for people that already sort of understand this intuitively but wanted and needed an explicit guide? So I think, well, look, the publisher's right answer is everybody, right? But I think one of the things we've learned about this book is one of the reasons we wrote this book was to get beyond this conversation, which was kind of Snapchat. It was kind of like shaming people for not understanding Snapchat, right? There's this dynamic which is like, you don't understand new technology, therefore you're a dinosaur. And actually, what's interesting about New Power is that it's really not about understanding technology as much as it is about professional identity. So there's a great story that we learned about from a professor at NYU, Hilla Lifshift Asaf, and she was inside NASA for this three-year period to understand something which this big change which came in at NASA. So NASA's like, you cast your mind back, it's 2010, they're under all this um, criticism, no one thinks they're being very innovative enough, they're not getting people excited, they're gonna get their funding cut. And so the call goes out at NASA, which is like, how can we create more innovation? And they start to experiment with something called open innovation. And so open innovation is like this idea where you invite the crowd in to do work with you. And so to kind of give you a sense of what happens, they put this challenge out to the crowd. And one of the challenges they ask people to solve is this problem in heliophysics. So basically, this is about how you predict a solar storm. So if you're doing space travel, you don't want to get in the middle of a solar storm because you go up in flames. So at the time, the NASA scientists had figured out a way to predict these storms one to two hours before they happened with 50% accuracy. So not great. And then they take it out to the crowd and this retired telecommunications engineer from New Hampshire comes up with an, an algorithm that enables them to predict these solar storms eight hours in advance with 80% accuracy. And so this is sort of this game-changing moment. They get very excited. The White House gets excited. And the, uh, the guy who runs this directorate at NASA kind of calls a meeting and says, we're going to transform NASA into an open innovation organization. And the meeting that he calls descends into mayhem and conflict. 
And the reason for that isn't about technology, right? These are people are literally rocket scientists, right? So it's not about technology. But what's happening is you're getting two very different professional responses to the idea of opening up your world. So there's one group of people who are like fiercely resistant, who don't like the idea of other people solving the problems, who are trying to keep the crowd out. And there's another group of people who start to actually shift their professional boundaries and find ways to welcome the crowd into NASA. And Hiller's work, it really neatly kind of sums this up. She says, there are these two groups. There's one group who think of themselves as problem solvers. I'm the expert. I'm going to solve the problem. It's all about me. And there's a second group who think of themselves as solution seekers. These are people who are going to find the solution no matter where it happens to be. And they have a very different sense of self. And when we think about new power and old power, what we're really seeing with new power isn't like it's people who get what Twitter's about. What it's really about is it's people who are prepared to understand that if you think very differently about how you solve problems, you can get to a different kind of outcome. And the big, you know, big thing we see all around us, right? We see people using these new technologies in profoundly old power ways. So essentially using social media as a way to, you know, rain down ideas, to send press releases, to your point about authenticity, with none of that, right? So it isn't are those about the cheerleaders. The are those the cheer- well, be the, considered the, cheerleaders? The cheerleaders are uh, are actually people who are embracing the values, but don't don't know how to execute on them. Oh, sorry, so it would be the connectors. It would be the, exactly. Right, right, it, it would be, the connectors, it would be those like guys. Who I might add, we rename in uh, in the book as the co-opters. Co-opters. Because they're really co-opting these new power skills, but they don't really intend to share power or to deeply engage. Interesting. So, you know, listening to you guys talk, I'm reminded of a book I read a few years ago called Empire of the Summer Moon. And it's a history of the Comanches. It's uh, by S C W or S W Gwyn is the author. I've tried to get him on to no effect, but I wanted to get him on because the way in which and the Genghis Khan and the, and the Mongols similarly organized this, they were very decentralized, right? And they had this capacity to manifest. I mean, the, the Comanches could manifest over a territory of fifty miles or more, actually, very quickly. I mean, they could raid a territory and come back. And there's something similar in this sort of like, you know, flock kind of effect. This manifestation of the crowd can just kind of come and leave, right? And uh, similarly, you talk about ISIS and about terrorism and sort of the way in which ISIS can crowdsource terrorists in territories where they can't Mm -hmm. actually uh, go, right? And there's a similar sort of visually the way I'm thinking of it in the way that a guerrilla war or a, a, a guerrilla a counterinsurgency happens in a city. People, you know, blend into the crowd and they come mm. back out. There's this sort of organic wave-like property to the way that these systems operate. Mm. I think that's so right. And really the goal of the book is to recognize that no matter who you are, you have to now understand that skill, right? So if you're a CEO or if you're an activist or you're a local politician or you're a local health worker, you now need to have this set of skills which can help you spread your ideas and help you lead and help you influence the world in ways, which is very different than the kind of old power playbook we're all used to, right? A lot of people kind of got their heads around the press release mindset and the kind of leaflet approach to how you think about change. But the people who are coming out on top now are people who understand that these crowds aren't just moments, but actually can be conjured up into things that deliver over time. And that mindset is so different. So, you know, you talk about ISIS, you know, we tell the story of this teenage girl, this Scottish schoolgirl, who is able to perfectly adapt her message to recruit other schoolgirls to join ISIS. And so, you know, if you're going to recruit Western schoolgirls to join ISIS, you need a very tailored message. And so ISIS and the approach of spreading that idea has to be very new power in order for that to propagate. If they were trying to direct their supporters, you know, as to how to spread that message, there's no way they would come up with a message that would cut through for an audience like that. So the paradox of our time is some of the world's worst actors understand that. They understand the need to unleash this agency, but they're doing it in service of profoundly authoritarian values. In the case of ISIS, in service of a vision of restoring a medieval theocracy. Murderous. You know, it's interesting you bring up ISIS, and I use the term evil because I I watched again, you know who came up in a recent conversation with Josh Wolf. Christopher Hitchens came up because I I really admired Chris. I didn't admire Christopher Hitchens much when he was alive. Towards the end, when he wrote on mortality, I uh, read it and I was moved by the book and I was moved by the way in which he talked about his death as he was dying. Right. But I was reminded somehow of Saddam. I don't know how it came up. And I, I remember, you know, and I think it might have come up in my sort of seeing what's happening now with Syria and sort of thinking about the implications of a war in Syria and ground troops and all this. Who knows what will happen? And I remember 
having taking issue with Christopher's p- the very pro-war position with Iraq. But I was also reminded of a story that Christopher told about the way in which power was taken by Saddam during that time, the, the purge that happened. I don't know if you've ever seen the video of the way he did it, but he basically, he brought in a beaten man who was sort of, his entire will was destroyed, and he brought him in front of the parliament, and this was, I guess, in the late 70s. Mm. And he started naming people who were in a supposed plot against uh, the Baathist party or whatever, and he named half the parliament. Mm. And he took out half the parliament, and there was a total mm. panic in the hall. Mm. And then the other half was then told to go out and shoot them. And Christopher talked about how that was the added you know, twist mm. of sociopathic twist that he, he said even Hitler wouldn't have thought of that. He goes, Stalin wouldn't have thought of that. And he thought about those things a lot. <laughs> and and I, this is a sort of a digression that came, was born out of the use of the term evil. And he said, you know, I don't use that word lightly and I've thought about it. And, you know, and in fact, it's a place where I think it applies because the stuff that we see, I think it's easy for us and again, I'm really digressing here, but Christopher had said, I can always tell when I'm in an argument with someone who hasn't been to a war, or hasn't been to Iraq, he said, because they'll say, yeah, sure, Saddam's a bad guy. He goes, no, no, no. He goes, you know, if you haven't seen it, mm-hmm. you can't understand it, which is why he used that word evil. And that's what I think a lot of those sort of, you know, organizations are with the types of things that they do and, and that murder and mayhem. But what you were touching on there was this shaping component, right? Mm -hmm. You guys call it shaping. You have this sort of uh, escalating chart here, which is the traditional thing is the consumption. Mm -hmm. And then there's the sharing, which is the proliferation Mm -hmm. of media and content. Mm -hmm. And then there's the shaping, which is, let's Mm -hmm. say, if I have a blog, I take some videos, I can cut it, I can do stuff, and, you know, it's... uh, That's right. Right. Uh, That's uh, That capacity to adapt, to remix, to change shape. And if you look at many of the ideas that have really cut through in recent years, you'll see that characteristic... There, think of me too. Yeah, and I think that's right. You look at me too as a, just as what's happening with that idea, right? It's not something which is just one thing everyone does the same way. It's designed to spread. So it's, it's, it's very actionable, right? You're asking people to do something. People are offering their testimonies in a very powerful, personal way. It's connected. You're doing that in a peer-validated way. You're part of a movement which is women all around the world, eventually, right, who are engaging as part of a peer community. And your voice makes the whole movement stronger. And it was extensible. It was a movement that could change into other things. So Me Too in France becomes Renounce Your Pig. So the movement itself, the language is able to change. And and that gives us an important hint into how ideas spread in the new power world, which is we're out of this era where the soundbite was the perfect model, right? There was this one perfect phrase and everyone would just repeat it. People want to do more than that now. They want to add their own flavor. Mm. So one of the things we try and address in the book is saying if you're trying to get your ideas to spread, you have to create them so that you leave room for people to add their own agency. That's a really important idea. And that really requires a different orientation to brand. So if you try to slap your logo on everything, if you want to own things organizationally, if the woman who first seeded this idea, Me Too, Tarana Burke, had tried to trademark it or copyright it, and these are common behaviors, this mm-hmm. happens all the time, mm-hmm. had tried to create Me Too as an organization and said, no one else can use this because it's mine, there's no way it would have spread. So when you think about the mindset that requires that if you're running an organization or if you're, you're anywhere, they're trying to make things happen, it requires quite a big leap from a lot of the behaviors that we've all grown up with. Hmm. I'm reminded of a few things as you're talking. One is our friend Tim O'Reilly's open source movement and how much of this is really channeling open source. I want to talk about that. I want to just say one other thing that came to mind when you were talking about NASA, which was after 9-11, sort of the hell fire, whatever, that descended upon the government and uh, the bureaucracy and this sort of the popular uproar against the bifurcation or the separation, the partitioning of the FBI and the CIA and the fact that they didn't cooperate and they went and created the DNI and right. all this stuff, right, yeah. to try to bridge the divide and share the intelligence and just speaks to your point, right? And then you have this open source movement that's really out of the technology community that was very successful with Linux. And uh, it has been such a big part. It's been central to the cryptocurrency space and to blockchain. I'm curious if you've studied that industry at all, because I think in interesting ways, the ICO is sort of the most complete culmination, I think, of a lot of these different expressions, right? Like the crowdfunding, the open source technology. You know, that's, I'm going to put that out there. You kind of tell me what bubbles up in your heads when I say those things. Well, just to start, I would say, I I think you're right that the open source movement embodies not only a lot of the values of new power, but also it shows you that if you structure 
smartly for participation, you can unleash all of this amazing collaboration. So don't forget that it's the design of these open source communities. There's actually really clever underlying principles mm. that incentivize collaboration and prevent people from lapsing into their worst human instincts. You put the same type of person, right, into a Facebook as a corporation and their incentives completely change, right? And it all becomes in service of this very extractive model. So design matters. And so the design of these new power movements and communities is critical. And we sort of unpack that in the middle of the book. We talk about what a new power community looks like, one where you do get that alignment so that people are incentivized to actually create value for the whole community rather than kind of descend into conflict. And I heard a funny, I, when, you th- when you're talking about the post 9-11, one of the, one of the interesting things about new power is how it's relevant to so many people. So we came across a spy agency so the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, and they do a lot of mapping around the world, right? They, they basically create maps around the world. And it's so interesting that even a spy agency is recognizing that the old power strengths that it once had won't keep it going in a new power world. Like they used to have all of the confidential information. They alone had all the satellites. They had all the data. They could live in this kind of very closed world where they could command everything. But they're actually having to shift their model to negotiate things like open source because they need to work out that actually there's all this value around the world of people engaging that they have to connect with. And they did this amazing experiment, which is they created a laboratory outside their, essentially their usual conclave, where they had no confidential information of any kind. So they took away from their spies all of the traditional kind of confidential information and like hidden things that they would have and said, you have to do this work in the open. How do you think about being a spy in a world where everything is open? How do you engage in that? And what that challenged those spies to do is to say, I'm going to take away all these old power skills you had. I'm going to take away the advantage you have of commanding all the material and challenge you to do this work in the field. And really fascinating to think that even a spy agency, as old power as it gets, it's having to rethink its world to operate in a new power environment. That's fascinating. You want to talk about language, right? And the constraints of language and how it sort of it affects your actions and everything. I mean, here you'd have to redefine well, what is a spy agency if you can't spy, right? And if, you're, if everything's out in the open, right? I mean, the very fundamental sort of definition you'd right. have to redefine that. And that's kind of the world. In some ways, that's the world that we increasingly live in. Hmm. So, you know, we tell this other story in the book, you know, you think about this as a strategy. So in a world in which everything is going to come out and more and more everything's out in the open, how do you like preempt that? So as an individual strategy, some people are really going hard on radical transparency. So we tell the story of a politician in Colorado who's running for governor right now for for this year, who simply puts up a section of his website that says scandal and controversy and declares effectively his entire sexual history. Um, You know, and this some interesting stuff there let's be honest <laughs> but the point is you know that's a very smart move isn't it yeah. and he's he's unashamed totally and, smart you know there are lots of dare i say it uh, president trump there are some very shameless people who are doing very well in 2018 well that reminds me of tom clancy novel turned into a, a movie which was a Pa- not Patriot Games. There's another one with... Uh, Hunt for Red October? No, no, no. no. With Harrison Ford. <laughs> we must be Patri- that must be the Patriot Games. Uh, pa- no, it wasn't Patriot Games. It was the later. It was a later one. And maybe it wasn't Harrison Ford. It was It was somebody else. But but I think it was Harrison Ford. But in any case, the president, and I think it was during the Clinton administration, but the point is the advice that uh, the Harrison Ford character told the president, he said, you know, during this scandal, he goes, when the president said, well, he's like, they're going to ask me for friends. And when we are friends, he's like, but he goes, he goes, I can't say that I'm friends. He's like, no, no, no. You don't tell them that you're friends. You say we're the best of friends. Right. He's right. like, you go all the way. And the president yeah. gets off the plane and he's like, yes, we're, we're, we're more than friends. We're the best of friends. And it worked for him. But yeah, I mean, I, I agree with that. And listening to you talk also, it's making me think about how I, I haven't properly appreciated the clash of cultures that's happening here. Right. Mm. So there's a question inherent is a sort of bubbles up here, percolates it. And I think it dovetails well with, with what's happening in blockchain, which has its technological limitations. And we talked about it on the show, but sort of the ethos of blockchain and what it, it's really saying about these clash of cultures, but it isn't just right. A clash of cultures. It's also institutions that have been built up over hundreds of years that are centralized right. and they have militaries and they yeah. have spy agencies mm-hmm. and they can hurt you. And the question is, how do they deal with this, you know, decentralized right. world where a guy with a 3D printer and a synthetic biology ingredients, whatever, can come up with a virus to, to kill a billion people at some time T, 
in the future, right? Yeah. I think that's right. And I think that that, that kind of big clash between essentially hyper-centralized and decentralized and open and closed clearly is at the work of, of what we've been thinking about with the book. But I think the truth of it is we ought to be very careful about over-romanticizing these things. Like, the, I mean, the blockchain in particular, we're hearing the same echoes that we heard at the beginning of the internet, right? Which is like, it's going to democratize everything and it's incorruptible and it will be perfect. And actually, the pattern recognition here is we start off with this kind of utopian view of these new tools and then they get co-opted. And so I think one of the things we think about a lot with this book is like the story of our age is this era of mass participation where we're all engaged. We have this kind of inalienable right to participate. But actually right now, two of the forces who are really shaping that participation are the platforms, the kind of hidden hands of the platforms who are kind of co-opting this new power. Facebook, Google, etc. Right. right. And then the heavy hand of the, of the strongman, right? One of the really interesting and unexpected things of our age is the strongman who we banished to the 20th century has returned but armed with a better algorithm, right? So you have this kind of really interesting dynamic and, and dangerous dynamic where we're all participating more and yet that's being channeled by platforms and strongmen. So part of the mission for the book is to say, look, what will be another way of thinking about our world? So think about China, right? This is mm -hmm. a fascinating Classic. place where, you know, social media participation in China is similar to levels here in the US. And think about how different that is to the amount of access that the Chinese youth had to global culture and that kind of agency at the time of the Tiananmen Square massacre. So it's this explosion of participation. It just fences off the political domain. And it's essentially making a contract with people that says, you guys can play, you can share cat videos, you can buy anything you want, you can gossip. You just can't talk about politics and threaten our, uh, you know, our regime other than in very particular contexts. So that is a strategy that is working. Well, it's brilliant that you brought that up. We did an episode. In fact, there are two episodes that you, I'm shamelessly plugging the show, but there are two Your episodes. Show. I know, sure? I know, but there are two episodes that- If you like third you party <laughs> endorsement, I'll do it. There are these two episodes you've got to listen to. Yeah, you guys <laughs> are helpful? great. Right. This is so much better than I thought. I'm sure I knew it was going to be good, but, and you guys are really great with each other. You've obviously, did you always have good chemistry Love on, on camera? <laughs> <laughs> looked across the boardroom. <laughs> looked across the looked across the boardroom. Actually, our spouses, I think, are- you know, like they're like, wait, you guys spend way more time with each other than you do with us, which is a growing problem. But when the book tour is finished, Henry, we might be able to we'll get our back relationships our back on track. Yeah, you guys have a good chemistry. It works. So the well, one you, thing... What well, you mean nicely is we don't hate each other yet. <laughs> 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 well, if you spend enough time with anyone, they get yeah, on right. your nerves. So you mentioned incentives. There's a really great episode we did with Sam Bowles episode 18 on moral economics, moral philosophy, moral psychology, evolutionary psychology. And that has been very popular in the crypto community around incentives and building incentives and thinking about incentives in, in building right. economic systems and crypto economic systems. There was another episode you reminded me of, though, when you were talking about the communist revolution in Russia, in uh, China, mm -hmm. which is we did a great episode with Anne Stevenson Yang on the Chinese banking system, specifically Mao Zedong and the contract with China around consumerism. Mm -hmm. And that really just works beautifully with your book, right? Because that is sort of, that is the base chakra of this sort of, you know, mm -hmm. world, this consumerism. And what we're seeing is moving past consumerism, right? But now to sort of bring it kind of back to where you were before that, which is, we were talking about some of the dangers, not romanticizing this, right? Mm -hmm. And there are dangers because even with Me Too and all these other movements, there is the dark, the dark element of this, right? Which yeah. is the mob, the tyranny of the mob. The founders talked about this. They were very concerned about it. And of course, the French Revolution brought that up. Burke wrote about it. I think some of them used the tyranny of the majority or, you know, as a term for it. What are your thoughts on the dangers of sort of trial by fire or, you know, judge, jury, executioner of the mob? Is that something that concerns you with what you're seeing here? Yeah, I think it is something which concerns us. And I think it's actually something which is supercharged in some ways in the new power era. So one of the one of the stories we learned about when researching this book was a couple who were making a YouTube videos called Daddy Five O, and they were kind of pranks with their kids, and they started to do these pranks with their kids, and they were kind of funny, and they got some views, and then the pranks got a little bit darker, and they kept doing them, and by the end of it, the pranks had kind of descended into things that were just completely inappropriate, and actually they ended up with the social services being involved, and they made this very heartfelt apology. Essentially, at one point, you know, the children wow. were in a dangerous situation, and and what they said when they made that apology was like. We just, you know, we went too far. We saw the views going up. We kept doing this extreme behavior. And one of the things which is being supercharged in all of us now is we're recognizing that to get traction 
particularly you're, you're pushing to the extremes. So one of the things we really wanted to address in the book was to say to people, like, how do you think about building a world which is actually a more participatory world and a healthier world? Because if we're in this kind of, you know, this mad world where everyone is chasing attention, that's really not going to lead us somewhere productive. Where we want to get to is somewhere where all this participation actually leads to some better civic fabric. It's a bit like, you know, biblical times, the time of Jesus, where everybody's, a, there's all these competing preachers, but you've got this at this massive... <laughs> I'm the Messiah. Exactly, right? Everybody's the <laughs> and everybody's a very naughty boy but you know it's totally supercharged right so it's at this incredible global scale and you know these things spread not over months and years but in minutes so that dynamic is dangerous and it's also true that from the perspective of the mob and you know there's as you know recent research backs up the idea that misinformation spreads more quickly than than facts but also it's more sensational it's more sensational the reality is that the, those people who want to spread lies and who want to spread extremism start at an advantage, which is why we think this book's so important because we want to arm up the good guys, and we hope your listeners are, are on the side of the angels, with these skills so that in the big arguments between a doctor and an anti-vaxxer or a climate scientist and a climate denier, those on the side of reason... Or flat earthers. Have you, uh, have you followed that I phenomenon? Mean, yeah, is, I mean, this is unbelievable. That is unbelievable. I mean, it's, it's 2018, but this is the point. We, we need to get as good at spreading these ideas and building these followings as these nutcases. It's bizarre, the flat earth thing. I don't know if you know, Kyrie Irving thinks the, the earth is flat. He's, I mean, he used to be on the plane on the Cavaliers, now I think he's with Boston. I mean, he gets on airplanes. To me, it's so bizarre, but it speaks to this thing that is true, which is that, and we've talked about this in conversations and on shows where we've talked about the hard problem of consciousness or in conversations about simulation and are we living in a simulation, you actually can't make definitive statements about the nature of reality from your own subjective experience. And you can get a pretty delusional state in these eco chambers of, you know, smaller and smaller subcultures. Absolutely. Black Mirror, I'm sure you guys have watched that. I mean, you're channeling that with some of this stuff here. What do you think of that? And do you think that that's a really great, I, I do, prejudice here. I think it's a great, uh, and I don't watch it because it's so freaking scary. I think it really shows the dark nature of this, the underbelly of this. So we use this frame in the book of the participation farm, that you that we all live on this participation farm where we're all participating happily, happily, others are extracting the value, and we're really not ending up in a very positive place. And I think that's the... Black Mirror kind of reflects one of the great fears of our age, that we end up in this world which is much more participatory but actually isn't very positive. So the question is, what do you do about that, right? One of the things we really wanted to dig into with this book wasn't the kind of like the sky is falling down and everything's awful. Mm. That narrative is well covered. So here are a couple of things that, that kind of we have in mind for a prescription. One is I think there's a real way of thinking differently about how some of these platforms operate. So the Black Mirror narrative is kind of we're all kind of overpowered by these platforms and we end up just giving in to them, right? But we can push back, right? We're seeing in Delete Facebook some of that political consciousness emerging. So if you think about a Facebook which is – or a Facebook-like uh, social network where the algorithm is – public where you can see a lot more of what's going yeah, on and open source where the uh, value is shared more widely mm. where where you can even imagine the idea of a public interest algorithm with a public interest test which makes sure the right things are in front of people where where governance isn't something which is hidden in in san francisco or, or in, in california but actually something we're all a part of we need to now shift the debate away from this kind of alarmism to this more structural discussion about the platforms we live in because they're affecting our daily lives our democracies and our elections it isn't just as much to, to click on our terms and conditions and, and get back to our cat video. Do you have any thoughts on I mean, I'm Yeah, I mean, look, I think we should be able to move our data and our friends and our profile information out of Facebook onto another platform as easily as we can port our phone number across from Verizon to AT&T. And that world would be a much better world because we'd then be able to truly you know, both live our values and move much more seamlessly. So the promise of decentralization, essentially part of the idea of decentralizing social networks, you know, which is enabled by blockchain, is it makes it a lot easier for people to effectively do that so that they're no longer in these farms which are fenced off where we may be delighted and distracted, but we're stuck on the farm and it's very, very difficult to get out. So I think there's a lot we can do. And, you know, ultimately this book isn't Black Mirror. It's actually a pretty hopeful No, no, no it's definitely not. You know, and it's trying to say, okay, we see this trajectory, but here are some 
amazing ways that you know we can reimagine some of these platforms because we're not luddites right we're techno optimists in that sense how do we reimagine the platforms but we also ask users to get a bit more serious about that so in other words you know we can't just leave it up to government to fix this problem they're not going to be smart enough to fix it on their own so we as users of these platforms, we need to rise up as well. Interesting. You know, hearing you talk, this is the second time during our conversation where I've had a deeper appreciation for your book. Because what you're talking right there is you're really touching on a sort of a new political science, right? Because here now everyone's saying there's a huge portion of the population that's saying well, we need to regulate Facebook. We, the government needs to do something. They have to have hearings. They brought Mark Zuckerberg in there mm-hmm. and, uh, you know, acted like they were shocked that uh, the company makes money from selling right. selling access to data and, you know, building profiles and information. And you were talking and I was thinking, okay, my follow-up question is going to, to you is going to be, okay, so Jeremy, how do we do this? Like, how do we do it? And uh, But you started to kind of go there. Talk to me a little bit more about how this would work. Let's take Facebook as a test case. They're in the news. How do you think a society using these types of models, this new power model, how would it address this problem? Well, you mean what could users do? Yeah, and also because you're talking about users and you're trapped. We're each atomic beings. Correct. Right, but we need to... Right. So, I mean, this is going to sound ridiculous, but bear with me. Uh, Think (laughs) of how we might be able to get people to leave Facebook the same way people joined the Ice Bucket Challenge. So you think about how these memes and ideas catch on. They require and they have a lot of social proof built into them. So you can imagine the delete Facebook movement on steroids where it becomes socially compelling and attractive to imagine how you do it. So you think about the Ice Bucket Challenge. The action is you make a video of yourself getting dunked with ice. Tell people, yeah, give people a little bit of a background on what the Ice Bucket Challenge is. Sure. So the Ice Bucket Challenge was this phenomenon that you'll all remember from three or four years ago where we couldn't escape this viral phenomenon of people making videos of themselves, dunking themselves with ice in order to raise money for the ALS Association, which until then had been a completely obscure you know, charity, right? And it had this incredible moment. And the reason is it designed this campaign that had these three elements of what we describe in the book as how you spread an idea. So we call them these ACE ideas. They're actionable, they're connected, and they're extensible. So it's actionable. There's an action you can take. It isn't just saying, watch this video. How important is this cause? The action is you make a video of yourself and, you know, being dunked with ice. Second piece is it's connected. It's connected because... The mechanism that made it viral was at the end of each video, you challenged your friends to do the same. So you you laid down a challenge. I would challenge Henry and say, all right, I just experienced this excruciating cold, now you do. But actually, the third element was probably the most important element, and that was that it was extensible. So it could be changed and adapted by the people who used it. And so, you know, there were videos that were perfectly tailored to those audiences. And, you know, we tell the story of how Patrick Stewart, he just gets a couple of ice cubes, puts it in a nice glass, pours some whiskey in, signs a check. So funny. And, and that was his take on the Ice Bucket Challenge. So that proliferation of content made it powerful. So, again, you could imagine Flea Facebook along the same lines of um, the Ice Bucket Challenge, where there's a social dynamic to how you could protest that would make it electric. We saw that with Me Too. You know, millions of women came forward with testimonies that they had hidden for decades because that new power dynamic got unlocked, that surge, that current got released. But they'll have to go somewhere. So one of the interesting, you can imagine the kind of dynamics of, of a flea Facebook, but where do people go? And I think one of the interesting things coming now is, can you imagine a model of something like Facebook that actually works very different economically? So one of the things I think we're quite hopeful about is the platform co-op movement, which imagines the kind of the the typical structure of the cooperative, but reimagines it for a age of platform. So you imagine, like, I'll give you an example, the, the Uber co-owned by its drivers. And, and, and that's actually becoming, in a way, quite real. There's a really interesting story we heard about in Austin, where one day Uber and Uber and Lyft simply switch off their apps. The reason is they've fallen out with the local government about fingerprinting. They can't come to terms. So one day they just literally switch it off and the city goes dark. So a group of technologists and government workers get together and they, they understand these kind of new power skills and they think, okay, how could we build something that isn't just a great new power model, but is also imbued with new power values. So they replicate Uber, and you look at the app, it looks exactly like it looks almost exactly like Uber from a kind of user experience perspective. But what's so different is the values of how it works. So what they do, it's a nonprofit 
all the money, 100% of the money goes to each of the drivers. You can round up and tip. You can round up and give money to local charities. And then eventually they start to experiment with really interesting ideas, like the richer drivers subsidizing the poorer parts of town. They start to share all of their data publicly so people can use it for public transport. And they develop this amazing culture around the model of Ride Austin. It's called Ride Austin, which takes all of that participation and actually focus it in a very local way on benefiting people in Austin, not simply benefiting these big platforms. So as we look to the future, I think we're very hopeful that you're going to start to see the emergence of models that take all of this new power and actually inladen them with new power values. And we see that benefiting society. It's also interesting when you talk about that. This is a, a revolution in how value is captured and distributed, right? Mm-hmm. Because in the case of Uber, you have a centralization of that. Right. In this case, you have this sort of dispersion of that value. Well, that's right. It's a bit paradoxical because you know you, you take an Airbnb, and to some extent, Airbnb is decentralizing the value creation, right? Because it used to be there was Hilton Hotels and the consumer. So all of the real economic surplus is captured by Hilton. What's cool about you know platforms like Airbnb is they create this new layer. That layer are the hosts, and the hosts are actually taking a big chunk of the economic value that used to get captured at the very top. They're not taking a chunk of the enterprise value that's being captured by Airbnb that's making some people billionaires, but it's certainly capturing that value. So the, the point that Henry's making is, could we reimagine these platforms where both the value that is being earned in each transaction and the enterprise value are co-owned by the people who make the contributions to them, by the participants. Well, I think that's what, I mean, in my opinion, blockchain technology will not be able to accomplish that because of their scaling limitations. But we've covered one on the show that I've let investors know, a seed investor in, which is Hashgraph, Hashgraph Hedera. And uh, I think Hashgraph has a real shot at being able to do that. And Hashgraph's a very interesting case because of the fact that it's, open review. So it's open source in that you can view the code, you can copy it, you can compile it. But it's not open source in that you're not allowed to take it, copy it, and compete against that system with the same code. Right. right. Yeah. And because there's an issue, there's a problem, an outstanding problem in the blockchain community, one of many, which is mm-hmm. the problem of governance, right? Which is the problem that what I've come to realize is that as much as I, as a sort of, you know, dillic libertarian, all right, understanding that there are practical limitations to that sort of philosophy. I've seen that you can't get around the problem of governance, that we're human beings. And at the end, you know, to bring it back to Bertrand, there are these forces are constantly shifting and shaping and transforming. And that it seems to me in my sort of studying of this, there is a tendency in human systems always towards centralization. Mm-hmm. And the question is, how can you sort of, and that's where culture comes in, right? Because culture is what is there ultimately, because institutions can be dissolved, but culture is sort of, is deeper and it's sort of an intrinsic sort of, you know what I mean? Yeah, right. and I think like, you know, Bertrand Russell, you know, reminds us that power tends to end up with people who want to be powerful, right? And so one of the questions, one of the reasons the book is talking about making people more powerful is we all have to reckon with our own power. Like the idea of we, we become these kind of passive participants in the world. And so the question I think for all of us is how do we how do we get that power into our own hands? And again, that was kind of the driving force behind the book was to get people to do two things. One, which was, okay, how do you do all these things you need to learn to do in a new world, whether you want to crowdfund something for your local community or whether you want to create a sense of community spirit. There's a new set of tools for that. But just as importantly, how do you kind of reimagine your own political life in the sense of you are more than just a consumer we've all given into this idea that we're these kind of like passive participants in our age we need to be much more active participants because the other thing we're reminded of with power is power concedes nothing without a demand and and i think you know in the economic sphere as well even if you want to put altruism entirely to one side it just makes sense so you know in the book we talk about this idea of the participation premium and this is this idea of today if you really want to for example if you're starting a new product you have to both have a sense of higher purpose and you need to have, you obviously need to give people something of value materially, but that is supercharged by actually getting people involved in the product itself or the service that you're creating. And if you think of this formula as, you know, higher purpose plus material value, supercharged, multiplied by 
participation. You get this premium and you see these extraordinary businesses built on this. You know, we talk about this brewery company in the UK called Brewdog. So it's basically a craft brewery company that decided to raise all their money initially through crowd equity. They got a crazy valuation from the crowd because, you know, they created such enthusiasm. And so they basically call their funders equity punks. And these equity punks run around and they have an annual meeting every year where instead of, you know, running through minutes, they all drink beer and there's a music festival and the crowd helps design the beer and label it. So you imagine here, right, if you're trying to be an entrepreneur, you've got to understand these principles. You mentioned Bertrand and about the people that uh, tend to have power, those who tend to acquire it, or people that love power. I actually have, I pulled out a part of that book where he talks about that, and I want to read it for the audience because it's such a great book and because I love Bertrand Russell, and we don't get to speak about him enough. Where no social institution, such as aristocracy or hereditary monarchy, exists to limit the number of men to whom power is possible. Those who most desire power are, broadly speaking, those most likely to acquire it. It follows that in a social system in which power is open to all, the posts which confer power will, as a rule, be occupied by men who differ from the average in being exceptionally power-loving. Hmm. Right. This raises the question of, again, the dangers, right? And But maybe not to put it in that sort of dark light, There's a, this to bring it also back to this issue of governance, how do you see governance and governments evolving. What will governments look like 10, 20, 30 years from now, given also the fact that we have these trillion dollar budgets Mm. for militaries, we have intelligence operations that are aligned with major multinational corporations. Mm -hmm. You have a billion dollar economy in China, which is extraordinarily authoritarian Mm. and has used these technologies to further and deepen and control. How does all that come together? Well, I mean, you're on the spot, guys. Let me give you you a hopeful example. And then, Henry, you can be doom and gloom. How about that? Well, I I might Um, give you another hopeful example. Let's let's try and double down. (laughs) Let's double down on hope. All right. So there's a coder in Taiwan called Audrey Tang. So we studied her work. There's Um, a coder. A coder. She was a coder. Amazing figure, this transgender activist coder who was part of the the revolution, the sort of protests that happened in Taiwan a few years back. And she actually entered parliament. She became a politician. She's now the, the minister responsible for the sort of digital economy. So she goes from being an activist to being inside office. And she kind of embodies she, all these open source principles. She lives and breathes that. She really gets it. So let me tell you a couple of things she's done. So one is she's renamed the people in her ministry participation officers. And she's given them this frame of how to be way more responsive to citizens in a way that just lines up with these explosively growing expectations that we all have now around, you know, having a say, taking part. Second thing she did, she actually regulated Uber in this very innovative way where, you know, the typical response of a government in the context of regulating Uber is just come down on them like a ton of bricks, don't really understand how you do it, probably destroy value for consumers in the process. Instead, she basically got all these stakeholders together, used this really interesting software called Polis and basically kind of crowdsourced through a pretty sophisticated consultation and negotiation process an answer that ultimately was fairly satisfactory to consumers, to Uber and to the existing taxi industry. So, you know, I think there are people who are thinking about this, who are trying to design these systems, taking the best of what's new, but also, you know, have a belief in the power of government and the power of the state to produce better, fairer social outcomes. And here's your second hopeful example, which someone tweeted at me yesterday, which is an idea called Global Welsh. And so think of the old power tourist industry. Global Welsh. Global Welsh, from Wales. The old power tourist industry, right, what do they do? They buy some adverts in newspapers, they print some leaflets, they have a tourist officer who makes everyone feel good about Wales. Global Welsh is an initiative which someone tweeted at me as an example of new power. I had never heard of it before. What they're trying to do is they're trying to get a million people around the world to be ambassadors for Wales, for what it stands for, for what it's about, for its values, for its entrepreneurship. So they're trying to build a movement around the country for people all around the world to help support and curry favor for and engage around what Wales is known for. Now, it's very early days for this movement, but the idea is a fascinating one, right? Which is to say, if the future is this battle for mobilization, if you're the tourist officer in Wales, your job is not to create pamphlets and leaflets and and adverts anymore. Your job is to do what Global Welsh is doing and say, okay, how can I get a million people who want to participate or 
around the world who love whales to create value for whales. And to do that, they have to release the agency of the crowd. And, and that's a very clear set of skills. So th- there's another hopeful example. Yeah. One of the things that keeps coming up in our examples is relinquishing control, right? What a difficult thing to do. But, but a rewarding one. Right. One of the things I think that people realize is we get stuck in this false binary, which is we have two choices. It's either highly controlled or it's chaos. And actually, the book charts this middle ground, which is to say, actually, you need to structure very carefully for participation. You need to, you know, it's not like it's a lack of structure. It's not like you take all the structure away. There's a very clear structure to movement building, right? But it's just not the same structure as as creating programs or, or running institutions. I'm reminded, I'm sure not entirely coincidentally, of a movie that came up a few episodes ago, Dirty Dancing. I was just about to talk about that. Okay, what a Ta- coincidence! You, what a, you okay, really that, weren't. Were no, you? I, 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 was, I just no one ever brings it up. <laughs> that that well, song was a great song. You know, there's yeah, that great scene that, it, when song. Patrick Swayze was. I forget the the, the Jennifer female. Lee. Okay, Jennifer, Jennifer, Jennifer Grey. Jennifer yeah. Grey. Yeah. I, I remember this very well. This is a very there, important part. You know, and he and he and he. You know, he's the strong masculine guy, but he's engaged in this. In what is very much dance is very much that sort of. Bending between the masculine and the feminine, right? Sure. And there's that one scene where he's, you know, he's taking her hand, he's, he's saying, not like that, not like that, and he's pushing her and he's pulling her, right? And he's, but then there's a transformation of that to becoming more gentle, right? And I don't remember the, it's a long time why the sort of they were in an argument or whatever. It's beautiful it was. hearing you describe this, though. <laughs> I'm moved. It's taking yeah, me back. I don't think I'm so doing a horrible job of it. I'm about to start singing. Uh, but that's what dance is, right? I right. mean, dance is, there's tension. There's everything. And even you want to talk about Me Too. What is dance, right? It is that tension of sexuality, right, between the feminine and the masculine and finding a way to navigate that line. So one right? way we talk about this in, in the work we've done is, is the difference between old power and new power, is the difference between thinking of power as a currency. I've got it. Mm-hmm. You haven't. I hoard it up. I spend mm-hmm. it. I control it. Uh-huh. I hold it over you. Right. To power as a current. It's something that is flowing and that mm-hmm. is engaged, it's made by many. And if you want to, you know, the old power skills. You can't hold. You can't hold. You can't. You can, can't, you can, you can't. You can channel, channel it. it. You can kind of push in the right direction, but you can never own it in the same way. And so what I think you're, you're explaining is this difference between a set of skills, which are these very kind of rigid old power skills, and then these very fluid new power skills. And what people, the people who are really getting up on top now are mastering both. Because again, one of our core arguments in this book isn't like we want to throw out all of our old power ways and kind of embrace this kind of decentralized utopia, right? The argument in the book is you need to understand both old power and new power. And if you can blend them together, then that's how you come out on top. And and, and you only look at something like the NRA, right? As an example of someone who is blending power really well. The NRA for years has scared everybody with their old power brand, right? Politicians run screaming because they don't want to get graded by the the wrath of the NRA. But they also have this new power current of people around their brand and organization who will make the calls, do their bidding, expand their messages, create their own ideas and memes. And they've blended new and old power together. And that's looking more and more like the critical skill of the 21st century. Is it fair also to say that there's something about relinquishing fear? I've always found mm-hmm. that control comes from a place of fear. Mm. When you're trying to control something or someone, it's because you're afraid and you're afraid of right. letting go, right? Right. So that's why it's sort of like it's a new muscle that, that everybody has to learn because it's not how we were raised, right? We, we went to school, you know, we went to religious institutions. All these institutions run on this consume or comply principle, you know. Capitalism doesn't actually teach us how to do this in many ways. It teaches us how to be good consumers. And competitors. So, and competitors. As Think of Donald Trump, right? That's the ideology. So it's a different muscle, but it's an increasingly important muscle. And, you know, you speak of fear, but think of the way some of these new power moments can unlock that. So it really was fear of repercussions that understandably held a lot of women back from sharing their testimonies in the Me Too movement. And when all of those people came together, so you could look to your left and to your right and you could see that you weren't alone, the fear dissolved and the testimonies emerged. You're bringing a politics there, Donald Trump. I think actually the perfect juxtaposition in contemporary times is Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton. Mm-hmm. Hillary Clinton was classic old power by right. all the definitions that you put forward. And she was so controlling. And in fact, people say that in person she was much more likable behind the scenes, mm-hmm. you know, when she was not trying to control everything so much. It's a perfect sort of personification of that. Yeah. And I think one of the things, we certainly the Obama campaign. So the Obama campaign was very new power, right? We mm-hmm. are the change, you know, we are waiting for and this kind of decentralized fundraising and the micro donations. And that really sure. ran through the, the Clinton Rolodex. But what was actually interesting about Obama was the presidency itself 
the new power he used to get into office actually didn't transition with him, right? The presidency itself was a fairly traditional presidency. Mm -hmm. And one critique of the Obama presidency would be he couldn't really pull old power levers and he couldn't really pull new power levers, right? He didn't manage to do both of those, either of those things as well as his supporters had hoped. So one of the interesting questions going ahead is how do you use new power both to get into office but then actually make the business of government more effective? I also think that there's something about charm. You know, Reagan and Obama had a charm that I find similar. There was a, a mm -hmm. similar type of charm in, in charming reporters, for example. When Obama was on the podium, he felt at ease speaking with people. There wasn't a rigidness. It wasn't Nixonian, for example. Mm -hmm. There's something, I think, also to that. Now we're stretching the boundaries of this. Mm -hmm. There's one last thing I, I want to bring up before we end, and that has to do with trust mm -hmm. and the importance of trust in society. Now, in some very technical ways... There are reasons I bring this up because it's becoming increasingly difficult to verify things. You talk about misinformation spreads, right? And these networks amplify that. And I think as I'm thinking, in trying to harness these types of tools, I imagine that trust is a currency that will become increasingly valuable because how do you enlist an army sort of or a, uh, an organization of people working almost spontaneously without the capacity not just to compel. Well, you know, this brings up National Socialism. Now I'm thinking about the Third Reich. In fact, I wrote about uh, the Third Reich, the National Socialist Movement, uh, specifically Hitler. And that's actually something I spent a little bit of time on recently in the last month, kind of re-examining how was it exactly? You know, I don't know if you guys ever seen the, the movie Downfall, mm, you know, Hitler in the movie. Bunker, right? Oh my yeah, God. Incredible. <laughs> I actually saw, I was reminded of that movie because we covered Tesla the last couple of episodes. And you know how there's that I'm scene- I'm interested to know what this connection is. <laughs> the connection <laughs> was between Tesla yeah, and- Yeah, the Hitler knows? implosion scene that became a meme. Well, there's, exactly, that was right? Well, that's a perfect Love example that. of what you guys talk about, right? Yeah. Yeah. It's sharing and then repurposing and shaping, and shaping right? It's a very good example. Yeah, that's yeah, right. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, that's a great example. Yeah. Hitler in the bunker saying like, you know, so. Exactly. It's very but funny. I, I feel that like, you know, yes, granted, you can have a Hitlerian for sure. And I, I guess I'd have to wonder. Yeah, I mean, for sure, there, that's the ability to arouse. But then again, it, with technology, perhaps will make it easier and easier for anyone to arouse through a technological medium. In any case, certainly for the light side of the argument, trust is so important. I think that as these tools, especially as it becomes possible with these new synthetic news technologies to be able to recreate people saying things on video that they never said. Right. Right? Yeah. I mean, people, I think, are going to increasingly have to rely on going to the physical source. And that's where encryption comes into play. You know, this are talking about identity and all these things. Like, how do you know yeah. who you're talking to, where you're getting your information? I think that's really important. I wonder... Do you think about this, this question of where do I get my information, trust, and sort of how that's going to play into this future? Yeah, well, it's, it's striking that, you know, we live in a world in which the people that we trust have changed a lot. So we used to trust, you know, uh, the, the, Walter the restaurant reviewer. Right. So that is a significant development. So the real dynamic now is that people trust the people around them. They trust their friends. And, you know, when platforms are well designed, they trust other strangers much more than they used to. You know, they trust other strangers enough to, like, you know, rent their apartments to them, to get in cars driven by strangers. I don't let uh, anyone rent my apartment. Have you, have you guys used Airbnb? Power. What? Air, do you guys use Airbnb? Occasionally, yeah. yeah. I wouldn't want anyone sleeping oh, in no, my Oh, no, I bed. wouldn't use it in my house. Uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm very happy to use That's a very funny, yeah, that's yeah, a funny no, point. No yeah, anyway, sorry, Jeremy, I interrupted so, you. So, yeah, so the way trust is constructed has shifted. And so we tend to trust people around us in these peer communities or our friends. But we don't trust the institutions that we feel have kind of betrayed us and are not connected to us. So when we experience government, we get the tax you know, the, the tax return, the summons, the, the jury notice. And we don't trust that institution because we don't have the same kind of, kind of relationship of feedback that we have when we go and stay at someone's house and they leave us a glowing review. So there's something very different about that dynamic. And, and what we argue in the book is just that that's a reality, that the most important institutions in our society that we need to protect and preserve actually need to get with the program on that stuff. Otherwise, they'll be left behind and no one will trust them. And on that note, uh, do you have any th you have any thoughts, Henry? Well, you've got you know <laughs> this is the way Henry puts it. Which this I, is actually which I the like. first. By the way, I, I'll just interrupt. This yeah. is the first time that officially we've done this where we have I have two people. This is a virgin experience for me. Well, I think it's how's, been a how's great. It be, how's your it first for you? time has been fantastic, right? <laughs> I think so. No, but I mean, you know, the... I don't know how to end it. I don't know how to end well, it. That's the thing. So, so, on a high point. You've got on, a, on I don't know how to end it. I've got two people here. <laughs> 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 well, we'll crowdsource it. We'll all we'll go new power. So I'll, I'll give by way of a conclusion. The 
I think one of the things we think about trust is that common critique is that people don't trust institutions. Mm. One of the reasons for that is that institutions don't trust people. That actually the institutions we care about most, they aren't creating these meaningful routes to participation. Mm. And so what we need to see next, uh, a time when there are so many people who want to engage, we need to see those institutions at the heart of society open themselves up to a new power world, create this structure to allow people to participate, and welcome in generations of people who want to do more to make the world better. Those people, we've never had more people capable of doing that right now. Our institutions have to do a much better job of embracing the new power world. Guys, I appreciate you coming on. This was a really wonderful conversation. Uh, thank you. It's really great. Treat. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And that was my episode with Jeremy Hymans and Henry Timms. I want to thank both of them for being on the program. Today's episode was produced by me and edited by Stiliano Nicolau. For more episodes, you can check out our website at hiddenforcespod.com. Follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at Hidden Forces Pod or send me an email at dk at hiddenforces.io. Thanks for listening. See you next week.